Thank you, Shweta. A very good morning to one and all of you. Uh, we will start uh, with ocular surface reconstruction. We all know what the ocular surface constitutes of and it is a derangement or dysfunction in one or more of these that leads to ocular surface disorders. The surgical intervention that is required to address the signs or symptoms of OSD that threaten the function or the structure of the ocular surface other than the use of a keratoprosthesis is what constitutes ocular surface reconstruction. The components of ocular surface reconstruction include the various components of the ocular surface by itself and the first two on the left which includes the tear film and the eyelids is primarily to stabilize the ocular surface and the main arms of ocular surface reconstruction include reconstruction of the phonics, the limbus and the cornea for uh, simbleferon or for initial shortening, limbal stem cell deficiency and corneal scarring or thinning respectively. So let's look at the scenarios which affect the conjunctival component. These are six different clinical pictures which more or less look similar as far as the conjunctival component is concerned. So is the management in all of these the same? Well as far as management of conjunctival or fornicial reconstruction is concerned, we need to answer two questions. Do you need ocular surface reconstruction or not? So the need for OSR in conjunctival management is to improve vision, to improve motility, to improve cosmesis, to facilitate contact lens fitting and as a part of a general ocular surface reconstruction. When will you not subject the above eyes to ocular surface reconstruction? Uh, when you are dealing with an immune condition especially for cosmesis when you have very dry eyes and when you have a keratinized surface. So what it means is that the first thing you need to know is what the etiology of the or, or what the disease is that you are addressing and the factors that help in decision making include primarily the etiology, the laterality, the tear status, the limbal status and the prognosis is determined by the corneal status, the age of onset and the intraocular pressure. So when you look at simbleferon or phonics short shortening, the most common etiologies that one comes across under the non-immune category is recurrent erygem or chemical injuries and under the immune category is Stevens-Johnson syndrome or ocular cicatricial pemphigoid. So when we look at a child like this who presents with a recurrent pterygium in one eye operated multiple times elsewhere, the questions that we need to ask ourselves are these and this is what will follow through every case scenario that I will go through subsequently. So it's a non-immune unilateral condition with a focal limbal stem cell deficiency and a clear corneal status that does not require any intervention and the eye is moist. So yes, we will go ahead with a phonicial reconstruction in this eye and uh, we have remained recurrence free for now almost five years following the surgery. This is another similar scenario in a patient of chemical injury where again the questions are almost answered very similarly to the earlier scenario uh, where chemical injury is again non-immune and we did go ahead with uh, the reconstruction and this child again remains recurrence free for almost two years following the surgery. Now this is a situation uh, very similar as far as the conjunctival component is concerned but in addition to the phonicial shortening you have a total limbal stem cell deficiency and you have corneal scarring and therefore the management here would include not just phonics reconstruction but also limbal and corneal reconstruction and this is a patient that underwent in addition to phonics reconstruction, limbal stem cell transplant and lamellar keratoplasty with uh, an improvement in vision subsequently. This is a completely different scenario where you are dealing with an immune condition such as OCP uh, with again a focal LSCD and clear cornea. So here the intervention would uh, depend uh, on the underlying immune condition and this is a situation where you would need to start these patients on systemic immunosuppression before you actually touch the eye. How it differs in OCP and SJS is that in Stevens-Johnson syndrome when you are doing a phonics reconstruction you might not need to really subject these eyes to systemic immunosuppression and you might be able to control the inflammation with perioperative topical and systemic steroids. Again this is a 8 year old child with Stevens-Johnson syndrome so if we answer 
the questions that are common to every case scenario, we would get an idea regarding our decision making in these eyes. So here we are not really sure of what the corneal status is. There is no thinning, but we are not sure regarding the clarity of the cornea. There is a total numbal stem cell deficiency. This is a child. This is a bilateral condition and you would need to do something for visual rehabilitation and this is a situation where you would probably need to take a decision between keratoprosthesis or a surface reconstruction and in a child you do not want to subject the uh, patient to a keratoprosthesis and therefore you go towards ocular surface reconstruction in this patient uh, with immunosuppression considering the fact that this is a moist eye and this is the outcome that we have had in this child maintaining vision over almost four years now with uh, an alloslet on systemic immunosuppression. In an eye like this which is absolutely keratinized and dry, well there is no scope for ocular surface reconstruction at all, whether it is unilateral or bilateral, whether it is immune or non-immune and these are patients when bilateral are candidates for keratoprosthesis but when unilateral you do not really have too many options to offer. Uh, as far as the decision making is concerned, especially in chemical burns uh, uh, in the chronic stage for limbal and corneal reconstruction, the uh, decision is primarily based on the laterality and the tear status, which is what we had published uh, in the management of unilateral total LSCD and bilateral total LSCD regarding how we take decisions based on uh, the requirement of keratoprosthesis, the phonic status, the dry eye status and the corneal status with the need for systemic immunosuppression in bilateral patients. It's important to understand the rationale and principles of phonics reconstruction in these eyes, which I have divided into four main categories, the excision of the fibrovascular tissue, sealing of the gap, tissue substitutes that are used to prevent a recurrence, and the post-operative regimen, which, is, uh, uh, which constitutes of topical and systemic steroids as the need might be. So here to understand the rationale, it's important to um, understand that what you're dealing with is the fibrovascular tissue that's demonstrated here in pink, the uh, conjunctiva which is in um, red and the tenons which is in green. And when you release the uh, simulephron, the gap that is formed between the conjunctiva and the tenons is what is called as the gap that needs to be sealed so that you don't have the fibrovascular tissue coming back through it and leading to a recurrence. So when you have a mild simblepheron and you have adequate conjunctival tissue that is left behind, all you would need to do is an amniotic with fibrin glue. When it's a moderate simblepheron, you would need to combine it with a tissue substitute such as conjunctival autograft along with anchoring sutures. And when it is very severe simblepheron, you would also need an oral mucosal graft on the palpebral surface along with the use of amniotic membrane grafting. This is a very short video to kind of highlight the various principles that I just spoke about where uh, what you would primarily the excision of fibrovascular tissue is something that we all are familiar with. Uh, it's important to enter into the plane between the conjunctiva and the tenons and mitomycin C is always placed between the two and not over the sclera directly which is what helps the uh, uh, prevent the recurrence and then sealing of the gap is done using fibrin glue as well as suturing the tenons to the conjunctiva which prevents the uh, fibrovascular tissue from coming out and placement of the anchoring sutures is primarily done to direct the fibrovascular tissue away from the globe so that you do not have it coming back and sticking onto the bulbar surface. Finally, the surgery is completed with the use of a tissue substitute, which in this case is a conjunctival um, autograft. And in certain situations to help facilitate the epithelialization on the cornea, we do use alloslet to um, hasten the process of epithelialization. So these are again to re-emphasize the principles of phonics reconstruction. And uh, for limbal reconstruction, we largely do know that it is autoslet when we are dealing with a unilateral disease, alloslet with immunosuppression for a bilateral disease and when you have an additional corneal scarring or corneal thinning then you would need to combine your reconstruction with either a penetrating keratoplasty as in the upper panel or a lamellar keratoplasty as in the lower panel. Also we need to be very clear about where ocular surface reconstruction will not work and these are eyes where we would need to 
subject the patient to a keratoprosthesis. So to summarize, these are the principles of ocular surface reconstruction where you need to control the inflammation, stabilize the ocular surface and then address each of the phonix, corneal and the limbal components. Thank you for a very patient hearing. Anyone interested in a short term ocular surface fellowship uh, at Shankar Nitralia is most welcome. Then these are announcements regarding the OSCON meeting in August and the Keracon in November. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Geeta. Uh, I think we'll, you have a question, sir? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, So this uh, talk primarily dealt with uh, surgical reconstruction. Uh, in these situations, you could choose any tear substitute. We are not um, uh, we are not specifying any particular category of molecule over the other when you are dealing with these cases. Where the need for selection would be very crucial is in a non-surgical situation when you are dealing with either an aqueous tear deficiency or a meibomian gland deficiency and we have a very detailed write-up on the artificial tear substitutes in our first issue of the Journal of Cornea and Ocular Surface where we have given uh, pointers as to which tear uh, substitute you would choose based on the underlying indication. Okay, thank, thank you. you.